Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, I think we can start the lecture, although it's maybe more students come in a few minutes. We can start. Is there any questions about, uh, uh, first of all, we will talk about it more uh, towards the end of the, this hour as well. But is there any questions about uh, project scheme and the general progress of the, the projects? We figured there were a little bit confusions about it. Project scheme is something that you sent to us before the second meeting. So it's not, uh, it doesn't affect your grade, so you don't need to worry about it. It is more for us to know what the status of your project for each group so that we have an idea before the meeting. Is that clear? And uh, does it, can you, can someone confirm that you can hear me in the chat, please? Yes. yes. So then we can start. Uh, let's try sharing my screen. Does my screen share work? Yes. Yes, I need to open the chat as well here. Great. So this week we we will have a look at cell-based complex systems that are also called cellular automata. So they are basically uh, simulations that, that are defined by rules that depend on the neighbors of each cell and their status. And then uh, we can maybe, which is related to the homework too, so we can maybe begin like last time, the demonstration of the, the second homework. So I'll open a running simulation and then try to share my screen for the simulation window. It should be this one. Can you see the simulation window now? Yes. Yes, great. So here is actually, I should maybe uh, share the whole screen. That would be just easier. So you see my screen, right? All right, so here what we were supposed to do in this homework is that uh, we have a, at each time step, we have a certain probability of a tree growth. So you can see here that if I, this tree growth, if it's too much, this, the forest is going to grow much faster. This will lead to bigger fires. If I tune it down to smaller values, it will, it will grow rather s slower. And here we have another parameter that is called the lightning rate, so in each step, we have a probability of falling a lightning strike. And then whenever there is a lightning strike, it burns all the trees that are connected to each other. So this was the homework. And this is a sample solution code that we will uh, upload to homework to folder in a few days, if not today. And uh, you, you can have a look at the, at the code and try to see if yours is uh, more or less efficient than this one. I think this is not the best efficient code you can make. You can definitely spend some more time, and make it more, more efficient, but it works quite smoothly, at least for the purpose of this homework. And it would work uh, in a reasonably short time to generate like uh, enough amount of fires. So while I was speaking, this already generated, if you can see here, almost a thousand fire events while also simulating and printing everything in real time. So this, I can put it here and we can have a very quick look at the code. So here what I have in my forest is that I have a status array, which is a two dimensional array that has uh, the same dimensions along X and Y. That is my lattice size and then I uh, create an image uh, object for, for printing the, for plotting the forest. And then I just uh, start my fire, fire count and then I start the, the simulation. And then these are the just, uh, uh, these are only to get the variables uh, in real time from the graphical user interface. 
So I defined these sliders up there. So you can have a look at this notation. Uh, it was the same in homework one solution. So it's using TK inter from Python and uh, using uh, canvas here and some sliders. It's very useful if you want to create an, uh, an animation where you need to change parameters in real time. So you don't need to go back and restart the simulation. What I have to do is only thing. I just increase the growth probability and see how the simulation is changing or I change the other parameters. And actually in the other one, you can also, you can also have functions and different buttons. For example, in the solution of the homework one, I had the restart button. So what we do is that simply we make a tree growth that is quite easy. So we generate random numbers that has the same size as the forest. And then we check if these numbers are uh, smaller than, uh, these are uniform distributed uh, between zero and one we check if they are smaller than the growth rate in that case and we also check if they are uh, if there is no trees there uh, actually this would not make a big difference even if there were trees because we are changing it to one so zero refers to no trees in this in my notation of uh, status array for the forest and number one refers to there is a tree there number two refers to the area that is burned this is the burned is almost equivalent to zero because there are no trees there anymore, but this is only for plotting purposes. And I put the number three, which is the uh, indicator that for, for my simulation that there is an expansion of fire. So I kind of distinguish between two and three simply because uh, this gives maybe a little bit more computational efficiency in each time step when I'm spreading the fire. I don't look at the, the burnt trees that are inside while I only, the only thing I need to do is look at the surrounding of the fire to expand it. And then we, we pick a random location. We, we choose integers of two integers of uh, uh, maximum number of my lattice size. So this will give me a coordinate that will start the fire at a random location. And then I check it just if there is a random event by uh, checking the random probability condition and if there is a tree on the on the location where the lightning is hitting and if that is the case i will have a fire event which will result immediately in increasing the fire count and then i need to start expanding the fire and then the first thing i do is i th there is one in the first step there is only one tree that is burning so i make its status to three which means that it's expanding the fire and then i have a a while loop here which means that while the number of expanding fire elements are greater than zero which means while the fire is still expanding this loop will continue and for each one of these expanding fire elements it will just check all the elements on the sides and if they are if there is also trees there it will turn their status to expanding fire as well and then at the end of each loop while i was running over these expanding firing nodes, I will turn them back to two, which is the burn state. So when they ignite the neighbors, their neighboring trees, if there are any trees, at the end of the step, they will turn back to from igniting state to a burn state. And this will create a rather efficient, but not, uh, maybe not the most efficient, but rather efficient. So I see a lot of people use the, uh, recursion algorithms that's definitely an option for 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 this uh, uh, homework a good option but not really compulsory or you don't really have to do it as you can see in this code i am not using any kind of recursion algorithm uh, i'm just checking here if there is any uh, 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 fire expanding fire expansion nodes that is left at the beginning of each step and then this repeats over and over until the fire is not expanding anymore. Uh, and then at the end of each step, I am just, uh, these are just to create an image that is uh, green where there's a tree and then red where, where there's a burned tree elements and then zero for, for the rest of the forest. That is That means there are no trees. And then I just create an image that is uh, updated in each time step. And then there is one other simple function that I, I, I give a little pause if there is a fire, just to see that the, the, the red plot, because if not, it's gonna replace the green 
plot quite fast, so we are not going to see the red color. So I'm just pausing a little bit the simulation whenever there is a fire, so that we make sure we see the, the red, so I can have an idea about where the fire is happening. So is there any questions about this? Is this clear? All right, so if there is no questions about this, this will be uploaded to the uh, homework two folder of the, of the files section of the Canvas page. You can go and download it and try to see how you can, uh, you could have written your code a little bit shorter than, uh, so if you can see here that this is everything I'm doing in a while loop is, is here. So I don't have any functions that I'm calling from outside and all of the, all of the things, including the, the programming of this interface with, with changing parameters is written in this file, which is 70 lines. And the core of the simulation is written rather shortly in like uh, 20, 25 lines. Actually, no, 15 lines. So you need to, if you want to uh, try to like uh, make a more compact uh, notation in your programming, it's important that especially this kind of, I also mentioned this in the first homework, especially this kind of uh, indexing with uh, Boolean variables is very important. It makes your life much easier. The, the similar type of code without using this notation would take you much more lines and would look much more complicated. Here I, am, I see immediately what I'm doing and it's only one line of code. So it's really, uh, clear to me that this is uh, what each line is doing here. So I recommend you go and check this code. I, I saw that most of you had quite efficient and nice codes for the for the homework two. So I hope to see the results for the homework three. <clears throat> and is there any questions? I I want to verify. I made an announcement on the homework three. There were some confusions about. Uh, some of the aspects and uh, I, I was curious if, if people uh, uh, have seen the announcement. Have you seen the announcement of the, about the homework tree on the Canvas page? Yes, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. If you have any questions, you can still, I think there is one person that connect, contacted me after that also. So essentially the, the confusion comes from the, most of the people's confusion comes from the fact that the, the, the rotation direction is uh, along Z. So we multiply it by this uh, unit Z vector, which is uh, simply because the rotation along X, Y is defined in plus Z or minus Z directions, depending on the rotation direction. So it's not really because uh, the simulation is three dimensional. Everything is going on along two dimension X, Y plane. What is only in the Z plane is the direction of rotations of each particle, which is actually, they are just uh, reorienting their propagation direction. So everything is. Don't think it included some of the errors in the instructions, the T zero for Passive particles, for example. T0 is a, is a normalization parameter for the torque. Uh, I am not, not sure if I understand the question. Samuel, can you rewrite the question in a way that uh, I can understand? No, T0, the, the passive particles are not, uh, F, don't, don't affect each other. They only affect active particles. Jonas has another question. I see that there is a lot of confusion about homework three. It's better we speak about it for a while. T0 is that. Okay. I will have a look, I, I'm gonna note it down and then try to check.
type over t0 okay i will check it out and i i will try to make a clarification on that also not included in the passive sum okay in the Okay, another question is the mean square displacement plot should is that should that be as a function of tau or t? It depends how you define t or tau so that uh, if I can go to the homework file here. So this should be as a function of tau because you are going to average that along t anyway. So you're gonna take a particles position for different all different t's and then you check where the particle will be in a tau time step, like a tau time amount later and then you check the difference. And then you take the square of it and you take the average for all different t. So T is something you are making the average on. And tau is the is a variable that affects your mean square displacement. So when tau is zero, your mean square displacement, for example, will be zero. Because when tau is zero, you are subtracting xt from xt and yt from yt. This will this will result in zero. When tau is one, you are checking the particles average displacement square of particle displacements squared averaged over all different times so you check the particles displacement for one step of time when tau is equal to 1 dt and then you run over all the all all the trajectory and make an average Yes, so average over T, so only one data point in the plot for each average, exactly. So in the plot, I should have, so yes, MST is a function of, as you can see in the equation, is a function of tau, not T. So that is not, uh, you have as you generate your trajectory. You have a trajectory that is fixed. It can be much longer than this that you see here. So yeah, that's, let's say you have a trajectory of 10,000 data points. You check the displacement of, uh, what is the displacement created by 10 time steps along X and Y? You find it out, you find the, you get the square of it, displacement square, and then you, you calculate this for all the trajectories. So you go to the first point, let's say if tau is one dt, you go to one dt later, you see how much particle has displaced. And then you go to the next point, you see how much the particle displaced in one dt. You go to the third point, you go to the fifth point, you do all the way around. So this will be, okay, I see the problem now. Okay, yes, so, okay, 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 okay. This is not, uh, so I see that here is the equation, is correct, it's 8.4, I also need to take note for this. Yeah, so this logarithm should be tau. There is a notation problem here. So this log should be tau. So equation is correct, not the plot axis here. This label is wrong, it should be tau. Is this clear? Yeah, I, I will also make an announcement that I will update this also. And we need to update this, this file. All right, so if you have any more questions about this homework, and the, and the, another confusion point was the was the 
volume exclusion principle. And you can see how it's done in this reference paper here. So it's this, uh, if I can find it. No, it's not this one. I got the wrong reference. Should be this one. So if you go to this reference, metastable thing. There are more questions. So does it matter if we use natural log or log 10? No, it should not matter. As long as both axes are in logarithmic scale, it doesn't matter. You can use whatever logarithm you like. Metastable would refer to the fact that it is, uh, these uh, channels are stable for a while and then they change. So they change from one form to the other, but they are not stable forever once a channel is formed, but they are stable for a while. A few particles will follow. It's uh, simply a phenomen phenomenological description. So these, it means that there are channels that are open for a while. If there are no particles passing by for a long time, they will eventually close. New channels will be opening. So don't get uh, confused by the term metastable. Yes, of course, the cha channels can will change over time. If, if you run the simulation for a long time, maybe the beginning look of the simulation will look nothing like the end in terms of channel uh, positions. But the general overall uh, simulation will look similar. You can see that the, the time step looks quite different here. And also here, you can see that uh, here in this paragraph, as soon as the equation of motions for the particles are are described in this in this reference paper, this is reference num number nine in the Homburg file. It's explained here how the overlapping particles are dealt with. So you just need to find the particles that are overlapping with uh, with each other, and then just move them away by uh, enough amount so that uh, they exclude. They apply essentially volume exclusion. And then uh, I understand that if the if the simulation is crowded, it might be that if you make a, an exclusion with two particles, this will result in another overlap. But this will not be a big issue unless you you use a lot of uh, uh, like that is a particle capacity that is like ninety over ninety five percent of the capacity of the lattice. So if you go very very high pack fra packing fractions, this might be a problem. But uh, you can actually run the same algorithm three times in a loop or five times in a loop. This will clear out quite nicely the simulations. And especially in the second part, un until you get the results for the second part, uh, try avoiding very dense uh, conditions. Look at this one, for example. It's quite uh, uh, dispersed. Uh, the density of the simulation is not high. Also, I highly recommend you always start with smaller number of particles, smaller lattice size. So things are simpler to see as well. I see a lot of students every year, they are trying to create a simulation for, a, for, a 200, for 200 particles from the beginning. That is, and if something is not running, and obviously simulation is not running well, and you, it's very difficult to see what is going on wrong in the simulation. If you have a few particles, if you, if you start with 10, you're going to see what is going wrong in the simulation, what is not working. If the volume exclusion is not working, or if the particle browning motion is not working, or if your swimming direction is, is not working for some reason, it's reversed each time step. If you have 200 particles, it will be messy for you to see what is going on. It will be very difficult to debug. So I highly recommend you start with something. We don't expect a thousand particles to see here in these results. If you have something for 20 particles, 25 particles that runs very, very smoothly and it, you can demonstrate results that can 
reproduce what we see here, this kind of clustering behavior, uh, it's fine. You don't need to make it super complicated. And also for this one, this one you need higher densities, of course, because you are going to need to observe channels, but try to avoid super dense uh, uh, suspensions. Like you can see here that there, there is quite a lot of particles here. You don't need to do this much. You can just make something that is like 30% of this simulation, and that would be quite acceptable. In figure five, there are, yes, these are, uh, okay. So you can see also in this, the video version of this figure, there are colors for each, uh, th that refer to each number of cluster ring numbers. These are not essential for getting a full grade on the, on the results. You don't need to make the same kind of color code or you don't need to uh, plot exactly the same way as this, as it's plotting here. So you don't, necessarily need to plot all the lines that are going because it might be tricky to to make this uh, i remember it was not obvious for simon as well the author of the paper so it's uh, you can try to come up with something that leaves a trail behind the particle for a for a while and more particles getting on uh, it, denser it is it's fun to try to play with it but it's not compulsory what we need, want to see is that if the particle follows a pre-opened channel and then if they show the similar behavior that we observe here. <clears throat> Have at least 100 interacting particles. Uh, that is for uh, I would say even uh, even less number of particles we we would we have given full points last year so you don't necessarily the important thing is to to be able to observe these different behaviors and clusters so the most fundamental thing is that when I look at the simulation the interaction between particles it can be I don't know how many particles are here actually here are hundred particles it would have been fine with for example fifty. The important thing, cr crucial thing, is that we see similar kind of behaviors when particles come closer to each other, and then they align towards each other and make these clusters. And this is visible. This is visible in uh, in the with uh, in for only depending on the noise parameter in your simulation. It's not. Uh, it's independent from from the number of particles. You can visualize the same thing. Of course, if you can. If you have it running for 20 particles, you can have it running for 100 particles as well. It won't take even a lot of time if you have the code running. My, uh, my point is that if you have something running for 20 particles, something for 100 particles will take only five times longer, but it will work. But if you try start from a thousand particles to begin with, you cannot run them smoothly and you cannot debug it because you won't be able to see what is the problem. That is the point. So it's very important that you start with a fewer number of particles with not a very dense condition. So this applies to generally all the simulations. And I will show you some examples of game of life now <clears throat> in, the, in the following hours. And you're gonna see that we're gonna start with very simple, what happens we have these three cells, what happens we have these five cells, and we want to see this works for us. We understand what's going on here. And then we expand the scale, and then we can go higher and higher and more complicated. But we always have to start with something small that we can understand, especially things when things are not going right. So, so there is a mistake, there is some problem in the code that we need to debug. We need to have a smaller number of particles, so it should run smoothly. Okay. Uh, so this I will upload uh, on the homework file. Uh, I hope this uh, will help some of you to, to, to clarify your code. And I can just cancel this one and then I can continue. So cellular automata is something that is, uh, so 
here in the in the first homework we were having a system that was agent based model there we were more interested in single agents in, here in the cellular cellular automata models we are more interested in the characteristics of a grid or local local uh, properties of uh, of an area so this is more used for this kind of purposes and these uh, states of each cell this this model focuses on cells so this is the first original the the, the simplest 1d model you can think of so every cell here is a finite number of state here for simplicity we start with zero or one one referring to the fact that cell is live zero means that the cell is dead and we need to define rules for each kind of neighborhood or each kind of status according to a cell's neighbors and the simplest 1d model should be uh, a cell's status should depend next status should depend on cell's own state and cell's neighbor's state in one dimensions a cell would only have two neighbors so how many let me see if i can can you see my laser pointer yes yes great so here if you look at here these are the rules so we need to define rules in the cellular automata for different configurations of cells so we start with this one for example so if you have a 1d model we have a, we have each cell and when updating each cell we have to look at the cell itself and we have to look at the neighbors on the left and on the right to decide what the status is going to be for this cell in the next time step and there are not so many different alternatives as you can see each cell can be in two different states live or dead and then uh, there are three cells that we are interested for each cell to decide what is the next step is going to be so two to power three there can be maximum eight number of different conditions and any rule can be expressed as a as a as a sum of eight rules so you just have to consider each condition and try to decide what will happen for each specific configuration to, to a specific cell. So let's say for this kind of rule, we, we see that if, if the cell is live and both neighbors are live, the cell dies. If the, uh, if the cell is live and only one neighbor is, uh, the neighbor on the left is uh, alive and then the cell continues to live. If the cell is dead and both neighbors are alive, the cell becomes alive again. If the cell is dead and only the left neighbor is uh, alive, the cell actually begins to becomes alive again. And then if the cell is dead, only the right, uh, right cell is alive, neighbor, and then the cell continues to live. If the cell is alive, both neighbors are dead, the cell continues to live. And then the last rule, if the cell is dead, only the right neighbor is alive, the cell continues to live. So this is an example uh, set of rules for one dimensional uh, cellular automata. And you can see here a cell's status actually here matters for the next step. Sometimes it doesn't matter, sometimes it doesn't matter. In this case, you can see that example the first rule and the third one here they are the same conditions in terms of neighbors the only difference is the cell's own status in the beginning whether it's dead or alive and this affects the final outcome some of them doesn't affect if you compare the second and four you see that even if the cell is uh, alive or dead if the, if only the net left neighbor is alive the cell will continue to live pretty much the same condition will, will apply uh, with the right neighbor. So this is a symmetrical model. The result of a symmetrical model will always uh, be uh, symmetrical when it's expanding. So it's an important notation for the, for the 1D cellular automata for the evolution is, is represented this way. And here the y-axis as we go down refers to different time steps. So the model is 1D, so this is a sample example model that is uh, governed by these eight rules. 
So you can see the rules here. Usually for 1D, rules are defined with this kind of, uh, of an array. So we, we can have maximum eight different configurations. So we define a rule for, for all these eight different beginning uh, original uh, conditions. And then we, we look for each cell, what defines the cell's uh, status, and we look for the rule here. Here we have a live cell with two dead neighbors, which refers to here. And then we understand that the, in the next time step, this cell will be dead, defined by this rule here. So we put a dead cell here. And we want to decide what is the future of this cell on the right side. And we, we look for the rule uh, for this cell. And that is indicated here. If a cell is dead, right neighbor is dead, but left neighbor is alive. Life, the cell will become alive in the next step. And you can see here, this cell will become alive in the next step. The same applies to this cell. You want to see what this cell will become in the next step. We go up and check the rules. It's here indicated that for this kind of cell, when only the right neighbor is alive and the cell is dead, it's gonna become alive in the next step. And you see that this is what's actually happening in the next step. And then you follow the same iteration for all the cells. Note that if all the cells and the cell, all the neighbors and the cell itself is dead, it will continue to be dead in the, in the next step. So all these kind of white uh, empty areas will continue to be uh, being empty unless there is a neighbor that becomes alive. In that case, in the next step, it also becomes alive for this particular case. Is this particular example clear for everyone? or if there is any questions for this one. Okay, I assume this is, this is clear then. Okay, so this is a simple 1D model that is symmetrically expanding. And uh, this is a simple set of rules. You can go uh, a little bit differently with the rules. So here you see another example. So this, is an example that creates a nice uh, fractal structure that is growing over time. So you can see here, we start again with one live cell only, and then we are, uh, our simulation is, is governed by these set of rules here that are indicated here. And you see that this is going uh, into a more complicated structure and you can, you can try, to see, uh, try to understand what's going on here differently from the other one. Here, the main difference between the previous one and this one is that uh, if the particle is alive and uh, both cells are dead, it will continue, be, continue being alive. This rule is different compared to the, to the previous one. So this, this creates a significant difference in, in terms of outcome, while the other one looks uh, pretty monotonic and expanding over time. This one looks uh, quite a little bit different and it represents some sort of fractal uh, structure that is going to have some repeated patterns over time. And you can always have, a, have an example that is not symmetrical. The first two examples were symmetrical, which means that the rules are the same in terms of uh, symmetry. So if I look for the same kind of configuration, but in the opposite direction, and you can see here rule in the fifth, num rule number five and rule number two here are very symmetrical. The same applies to rule number four and rule number seven. So the simulation will always run uh, symmetrical in both directions, which doesn't have to be the case. As you can see in this example, there is a breaking of symmetry. If you can see here, this rule number four here indicates that if a cell is dead and only the left neighbor is alive, it will continue to be dead, to be dead. But if a cell is dead and only the right neighbor is alive, the cell will become alive in the next step. So rule number four and rule number seven here in this example are different. They're not the same, they're not symmetrical. So this creates an asymmetry and the simulation will uh, expand in, in uh, the, the the live status of the cells will expand in one, one direction than the other. 
So you can see here that this creates an asymmetry favoring the, the propagation of the cells, live cells, to the, to the left as the time proceeds. Is this also clear? Okay, so I think it's a good time that we, uh, I make uh, some clarifications about uh, some things for the project and then we can proceed in the second hour for the two dimensional models and, and the description of game of life and its, its examples. And uh, uh, we discussed with the student representatives last week, we had a meeting about the overall course progress and uh, I, I see that most groups have uh, formed their uh, uh, connection with their uh, group members and are proceeding good. There were a few confusing points. One of them is project scheme. As I told you in the beginning of the class, it is not something that you need to worry about. It is something that we, develop, we, we only read before the, the second meeting. So the better the scheme is, maybe the more feedback you're gonna get in the, in the second meeting. And the more comprehensive you, you write it, uh, the more information we will have, the better idea we will, have, we will have about your simulation status for the project before the second meeting. So it's more for us than for you. But uh, if, you, if you haven't completed something uh, that is not looking super com like, uh, comprehensive yet, it's absolutely no problem. You just need to send whatever you have. And, you're not graded over that, so you don't need to worry about it. Is that clear? So if, whatever simulation you have, uh, you have built and uh, some preliminary results, if, if you have any, should be sent with some kind of uh, introduction sentences, ideally, and what you plan to do next, so that we come more prepared to the second meeting, so we can read it, we have an idea about your status for your for your group. That is one thing that you want to clarify. The other one is the research question. So your original research question in the final report should be answered in, in your report and your presentation and should have a uh, nice link from the question to your results. But this doesn't mean that you should have this original question from the beginning. This, this can iterate during the research. This is important that you, you understand this. So you need to re, you can restructure your research question at the end of your, your project. You can, you can change it, but it's important that the final research question you decide, you need to be answering that and that needs to be connected to the rest of the presentation and your report. Is this clear? Okay. Uh, that's good, and maybe we can have uh, a 15 minute break now. Uh, we can come back and start at 11. Right, let's continue. So I can maybe share my screen. Do you see my screen? And you can hear me clearly. Can someone confirm? Yes. Great. So we can continue with the 2D models of cellular automata and how they are usually defined. So in 2D model, compared to the 1D model, there are of course uh, many more neighbors. The neighbors can be defined as uh, von Neuber neighbors, Neumann neighbors, or Moore neighbors. So difference is essentially the diagonal neighbors, where von Neumann actually uh, uh, does not include the di diagonal uh, neighbors, where Moore does. So in this case, where the for von Neu Neumann neighborhood, there are actually four neighbors, like, apart from our uh, cell that we are looking at. And uh, according to Moore's rules, there, there are uh, uh, eight neighbors that we are considering. So there are two times more neighbors in the in the Moore's set of rules. So you can see that this gets particularly more uh, complicated if you, if you think about it. if we have eight neighbors in our cell, we have nine elements. And even if the simulation itself is binary, which means that a cell can only be dead or alive, this 
can be generalized with uh, to a two to power nine different uh, 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 set of rules, which is over a hundred different uh, rules can be defined for each simulation. Whereas von Neumann is uh, significantly easier. There can be thirty-two different rules, so it can, it is uh, significantly more complicated or complex than the than the one D model, but it's still much less uh, uh, complicated than the Moore's model. And the rules also can be defined in polar coordinates in, instead of Cartesian coordinates. So this can be uh, uh, the simulation. This can be very powerful in modeling polar systems that are, for example, galaxies and clouds and these kind of simulations can be can be done using polar coordinates and rules in this case will be defined according to the polar neighbors. So uh, this is a different example. And then we can uh, have a look at uh, specific example the most of the rest of this lecture will be about uh, a famous example of uh, of uh, cellular automata that is defined as game of life so game of life is a very unique game that has been studied by so many mathematicians before and has a rather simple set of rules and it's quite uh, symmetric rules along different directions so the rules goes as follows so if so the, here is the first rule if i can put some yes i have a pointer so a cell dies if it has fewer than two live neighbors so it doesn't matter if a cell is alive or dead if it doesn't have two alive neighbors it will die and then the second rule is that if our cell is live and it and it does have a two or three live neighbors it will live to the next generation so the smiling faces refer to the fact that they're going to live in the next step and the ugly or like exhausted faces will refer to the fact that this cell is going to die in the next step a cell with more than three live neighbors dies so this one is uh, uh, for example has four live neighbors this is going to die in the next step and then a dead cell will be brought back to life if it has exactly three live neighbors. So this is the case that is shown here on the right. So if a cell is dead and it has exactly three live neighbors, it will come back to life in the next step. And if a cell is alive it has and it has two or three neighbors that are alive, it will continue to live. If it has more than three cells that is alive, that is four, five, whatever number higher, is gonna die in the next step. And if a cell has only one neighbor that is uh, alive, it will die in the next step. So these are the fundamental rules that can create the game. Uh, is these rules clear? Yes. So we can go on simple examples here. So, so let's say we, we know these rules now. So we have a we, we try to predict what is going to happen with this kind of a simple example. So we have a live cell in the very center. We try to predict first of all all the outer cells here. They don't have more than two. They're all dead and they don't don't have more than two live or or ex for a cell to be becoming alive in the next step, it needs to have, have exactly three live neighbors, right? Can you see which ones will become alive from the dead ones in the next step the ones that have exactly three live neighbors right so it's this one here you can see this one uh, can someone confirm you can see my laser pointer in the chat yes so this cell has exactly three live neighbors which means that this cell will become alive in the next step and also this cell will become alive in the next step. Similarly, all the rest of the dead pixels, since they don't have three live neighbors, will say the same as dead. And this cell in the middle is living and it has two live neighbors, so it's fine. This will continue to live. However, the cell that is on the right and the live cell that is on the left, they don't have two live neighbors. They're going to die in the next step. So this will change to a different structure. 
you can you can see a simple structure will change to this structure in the next step. Is this clear? Yes. And actually, this will go on uh, kind of forever. If this is our lattice in the third step, if we go one step more, this will go back to the original state. And the next step, this will go back to this state. So another example of a, of a periodic motion is this. If you can just think of how this is going to proceed, it might be a little bit more complicated to think about, but it will take you a few seconds to figure out. This will turn into this one. You, so if you think about the individual points, for example, if we focus on this one, this has three neighbors that are alive and it's dead, it will become alive, which is shown here. And this cell has two live neighbors, so it will continue to live. And this dead cell has three live neighbors, it will become alive in the next step. So you see. And also this will, if you if we consider this one now, if you if you check this cell, it's gonna become dead again because it only has one live neighbor. This one will continue to live. This one will die. This one will become alive because it will have one, two, three live neighbors. So actually this will indeed go back to the original state. So this will be some kind of oscillation, oscillation between two different states that we, we demonstrate here. But not all states are like this in game of life. Some can be totally stationary. For example, this kind of square. You can see that all the living cells have three neighbors that are alive. So this will result in these all these cells that will that are that are going to continue to be alive in the next time step. And all the dead cells that are surrounding these, none of them really have three neighbors that are living, so they cannot become alive. This actually will be stationary forever if we start with this kind of initial condition. For example, if you check this one, this is kind of a similar situation. Here we see that all the cells that are alive have two or three neighbors that are alive. So they won't really change their status in the next step. And all the cells that are uh, dead, none of them have exactly three neighbors that are alive. If you check, this has uh, five neighbors that are alive, so it cannot become alive. This has two neighbors, this has two neighbors, this has two. none of them have three neighbors that are alive. So they are not able to come back to life from their status. So this won't change either. So you can see that in, in a lot of different structures can remain the same or change to a different structure, or they can come back, they can have periodic. And some other structures can also be uh, propagating in game of life. So they change their structure in a way for each step that they propagate along space. So a lot of different objects in, in, this, uh, in this game can be defined in three different categories in this game. So some of them are uh, the, the stationary one, totally stationary ones are called stills. So they don't really uh, move at all. They don't really change their structure or orientation. Nothing changes over time. So you can see some kind of examples here on the left. And there are other kinds that are called oscillators. And you can see here that they change from one type to the other. And they always go back to the original condition. The period doesn't have to be two. So here you see that the first uh, three examples have a period of uh, two steps. So every two steps, it goes back to the original, but it doesn't have to be always like that. You can see that there is this one that is called pulsar as a period of three. So in three time step, it goes back to its original state. And uh, uh, pentadecathlon that you see here, this goes back to its original state in 15 steps. So they all have, they might have different uh, periods, but what they do essentially is that they do not propagate in space. They just stay where they are and they kind of repeat different kind of change in their shape. And uh, this is how they behave. And a different kind of initial condition can lead to what people call spaceships in game of life. So these ones are changing their shape in a periodic way but they, they also propagate in space. They don't stand stationary. They go to the next step in a, in a way that uh, uh, is uh, 
represented here, for example. So we can actually uh, try to visualize one of the uh, spaceships in the example code we have. So if you have seen the canvas page files, you can go to this lecture six folder. Here there is I would call the ducks and chickens. Which ones are they? Okay, this one is chickens. Some students think, yeah. Could be. This one actually, I can see that it looks like a duck. Maybe this one. Yeah. It might be. They, they are usually referred as spaceships. I don't know why, but for, for some. So. Uh, here, if you go to lecture six on the files, you can see here in the additional study folder, there is the code, sample MATLAB code. This is not a code that we wrote, but it's available publicly online and you can download it and try to play with it. And it's a, it's a MATLAB code with a, with a nice user interface. What you can do is you can always uh, uh, make it more simple. You can clear, you can draw, for example, I can draw some spaceship that will propagate and then i get out and then i try to decrease the speed so we see better here for example i i play and i try to see how it's propagating and i can change the speed to see in a different way how it's going so this is a nice code the advantage of this code is that you can uh, easily draw, draw your own shape and then try to see what's going on with the with a specific shape you draw you can draw and then try to see what's going on over time with this shape you're gonna you're gonna draw and you see that this one converged to a square and then it was stationary after that and if it reaches a stationary state this simulation will essentially stop so it's very easy and intuitive for you to understand you can try different things you can clear and you can also put some uh, boundary con like uh, initial conditions that is uh, standard so you can see here that uh, there are different examples that you can you can start with and you can you can start and then try to see what's going on with you see here that this simulation for example is a different kind and it's kind of uh, creating these sort of spaceships or bullets that are going from one to the other and here there is a number of uh, maximum iterations that you can put here and uh, if that is reaching to that number, it's gonna stop, but you can put this into a higher number or you can click here on the infinite loop. This will result in running in the infinite loop. So it's a very nice environment that you can go and try play for yourself to, to see what generates different kind of behaviors. Is, is this clear? And you can also uh, try to have a look at the code. It's a very well written code, but it's uh, it's quite a bit of lines. But it also comes with this uh, creates this nice uh, user interface. So there's a lot of programming for the for the interface here. This is exact uh, again. I, I uh, as I tell you, this is not our own code. So you can read the readme file here for the manual here and the license text for the for reference to the authors of this code. So it's a nice code that you can play with and try to see if you want to recreate something similar, what would be the kind of a good approach that you, you, you write. All right, so we can go back to the original uh, presentation. Is there any questions so far? Okay, so uh, here is another one uh, that is uh, quite a illustrative website that is, uh, I will upload this presentation file in the home lecture files after the, after the lecture. So you can go and check yourself. So these uh, people have a lot of uh, uh, different kind of examples and they are, uh, they demonstrate here all the rules and it's very nicely documented. And you can also here have a browser 
uh, interface that you can uh, play with different things. And they also have a GitHub page that you can refer to and <clears throat> download their code from there as well. So mm, here what is nice is that you can, you can try different kind of initial conditions. For example, you can try something random and try to see what's going to happen in the, in the next steps. And then uh, you're gonna see that uh, this one is running quite smoothly with a lot of different parameters, but this looks quite random. The, this one is a different kind of initial condition. You can, you can always go back, for example, there is this one that is called glider duplicator. You can see there are these spaceships that are generated inside here and uh, propagating along the space. And then there is this, for example, that something called two, that is some kind of a structure here that is periodically changing, but also there is this additional cells that are created and kind of propagating across the space. So you can also go here, try to play with different kinds of parameters here. And then what is good here is that you can actually uh, try to uh, stop the simulation with clicking on this single step and then try to go step by step to see what is going on in this in these cells one disadvantage is that this is a little bit uh, too small a little bit too many cells but if you zoom in you're going to see in detail what's happening in this this individual cells for each time step so you can actually try to see how the simulation is proceeding so this is another example of uh, of game of life and how it's represented in, for different kind of initial conditions. So you can see, and game of life is some is an example that has been studied for a for a very very long time. So people have come up with a lot of different initial conditions and a lot of different uh, 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 outcomes. And there is even a there was there is a page on on the web that is uh, ranking all these uh, uh, conditions of game of life and how many times they have been run and uh, there are the ones that have been running for years and years and years and trying to kind of this is kind of another competition in itself and people are trying to simulate different things and all uh, this can lead to a lot of interesting but most importantly for the case of Game of Life, beautiful simulations that look like uh, uh, some animation of life. But the main problem that Game of Life has is that it has uh, limited uh, conditions for movements of the, of the particles. So in this case, you can see that uh, uh, any propagator can propagate along X, Y. Let's say if we speak on the, like, uh, directions it can it can move to north east west south and then south east southwest north east north east and northwest so it, it it can uh, the propagators or spaceships as they as people define it can only move in these eight directions so it is not possible to create something that would move along a different direction so any any kind of uh, simulation we generate the particles or the propagators you we will see are be are going to be moving in a certain direction that can be x or y or or this diagonal direction that are, that are in the other one like for example this one the glider or a spaceship you can see that it's moving along a x and x or y direction and glider is moving along a diagonal direction that is 45 degrees along the principal axis. So I, I recommend you, you check these kind of, uh, you can check either this web page or the, the code we left in the, in the lecture files. You can download and then you can also go to their GitHub page, but this code is not written in Java or, or not written in uh, Python or MATLAB. So, but you can still download and go to their GitHub page and try to try to play with the, the parameters. So this is a rather more efficient code that is uh, running smoothly on a larger scale than the MATLAB code. 
Uh, is everything clear so far? All right. So here is another example of uh, uh, what can be done with uh, in terms of more complicated uh, results with regards to game of life. So you can see here, and this is uh, called life in life. More complicated and challenging structures can be designed in game of life that can lead to a very uh, different kind of shape. Here you can see something that is, uh, you're gonna see what is happening in this kind of small simulation environment is that uh, there are cells that are very slowly propagating inside a much bigger cell. So this kind of represents maybe uh, the, the life inside a cell kind of looks like it. And then, when you zoom out, it looks like all different kinds of cells are uh, interacting between each other in a unique way. That looks like the, a macroscopic kind of game of life structure. You're gonna see how it looks like now in a few seconds as, as the simulation is zooming out. Of course, one needs to design very finely all these kind of boundary conditions around the cells carefully to make the simulation run in a way that it is gonna uh, create this kind of behavior. Keep in mind that as it zooms out, the simulation speed is accelerated significantly. So you can see that this uh, final behavior is going to simulate the, a microscopic game of life simulation while inside there are thousands and thousands of smaller elements that is doing in the in the microscopic scale same kind of behavior of course designing something like this is uh, uh, going to take a lot of time and going to take a lot of effort to design all these necessary uh, initial boundary conditions that would result in something like this so this is not something that uh, maybe someone came up in one day but this is just one example of how complicated in terms of structure or outcome one can make in a, in a, in a kind of game of life simulation. So uh, I recommend you go in the, if you go in, into this, uh, simply you can go to YouTube and just uh, uh, type uh, complicated or cool game of life simulations and you can see some kind of, usually there is a good description in the videos and you can see the the author of each kind of uh, these kind of initial conditions and then how they propagate and what are the uniqueness and properties of the simulations but you can see that this has a, a maybe it it has kind of some sort of a limited re repeated structure but it's so many elements to design with all right so you can go to the uh, uh, a more generalized case of game of life which is called smooth life and this can also be uh, uh, more accurate or successful in terms of uh, simulating something that looks like the real microscopic cell life because uh, the cells don't really expand or move in in uh, eight different directions that are primary axes and the diagonal axes they can expand or move in all directions. So in this smooth life, rather than the ga original game of life, it's the, the, the original rules are very similar, but it works in a continuous domain. So if a cell is has a, surrounded by certain num uh, amount of area that is live around it in terms of its cylindrical, cylindrical boundaries, it will continue to live or it can become alive and if it has uh, no neighbors that are alive it's gonna die it works very similarly but it has also it can also have continuous values from zero to one so it's not really by like zero or one and in this case the uh, the the boundary conditions are circular and the the main advantage is that in this kind of particular example the cells can uh, expand or move in all directions as opposed to the original case of Game of Life, where it, the movements can only be essentially in eight different directions, which was east, west, south, uh, east, west, south, north, and then the 
diagonal directions, northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest. But in this case, you're gonna see that if, if I play this one, you will see that uh, there can be some kind of spaceship behaviors, but they are going Uh, is this technically cellular auto automata? Yes, this is technically, uh, so this is not uh, uh, discrete as the cellular automata, but the algorithm is very similar. So it, it works in the, I'm not really sure in terms of technical description if this qualifies as a cellular automata model, but I would guess so. So there are elements here also, but they are uh, much smaller than the much smaller than the normal game of life, and they consider their cylindrical boundaries instead of their uh, Cartesian boundaries uh, neighbors. So you can see that the propagation or, or or the movement or expansion of of the structures can be in any direction. And this kind of gives, uh, like reminds people of more like uh, how uh, proteins or lipids move or connect or structure in a real cell environment. So it's kind of, uh, it is named as, as smooth life. You can, you can check it out. I put this video as a, just as a reference that uh, is, uh, you can go and uh, uh, check more, in the details of the video description, or you can just uh, Google Smooth Life and have a look. And there are lots of online uh, libraries that is available for, for, for both Game of Life and Smooth Life. So you can find easily uh, different codes on GitHub to try to replicate, try to try your own initial conditions and try to see what happens with different kind of uh, uh, rules that you can define. You can take one and then modify the rules and try to see what is going to change in your simulation. You can try to see, for example, most of these ones don't have uh, anything that is uh, stochastic, for example. In, in Game of Life, uh, there is no stochasticity uh, included in the original simulation. So what you can do is that, uh, let me share the, Screen. Uh, sorry. Here. So here you see that when we start something uh, pre-designed like this one in Game of Life, it looks very structured, and what is happening is quite uh, organized, and it's repeated in a nice way, and we can visualize it. However, if you start with something random, you can see that it's quite, uh, I would say chaotic, what is going on in the beginning. And it looks like some kind of little explosions ha happening all over, the, all over the screen in the beginning. Then it comes up, come, come, kind of comes down to a settled state. And this you can also in include in your own simulation in a continuous way by just changing the rules a little bit stochast stochastically. For example, uh, the, the cell might uh, become alive if there are three live neighborhoods, but also there is a small chance maybe that the cell may become alive with two live neighborhoods as well. So the small kind of stochasticity that can always be introduced in these kind of simulations and that would give a, uh, a different kind of uh, uh, look in the, in the simulations. You can easily see that this reached a final state that is not changing anymore, that is stationary in this, in this kind of randomized initial motion. But if the randomization is continuous, meaning that if a cell can become alive with two neighbors with some sort of smaller probability, and this, can, this probabilities can be, become parameters in your simulation, you can easily expand this to a continuous simulation that would never reach to a final steady state, but it may reach a kind of, uh, uh fluent uh, final state that is uh, in average that looks like a certain kind of density and certain kind of uh, structures but it's not really reaching a final state that is totally stationary or like uh, repeating the
the same kind of motion all the time. So this is not reaching, for example, a stationary state, but what is happening here is quite uh, periodic and it's kind of uh, uh, repeating the same structure. It's the same with most of these other initial conditions here you can find that people have designed. So you can see that this will keep shooting these kind of spaceships to the southeast. And uh, here there will be this kind of the same periodic motion in the, in the northwest. And this will continue like this forever. But the randomized case looks a little bit more complicated and unorganized. Or uh, I would say more chaotic. So the one thing if you can, if you want to include another parameter in the additional parameter that would make it more complicated, the rules of game of life, you can always introduce stochasticity. This will, this will make the simulation a little bit more exciting and you can, you can try to see and you can easily do it modifying this MATLAB code here. You can try to see where the where the rules are handled in this code and try to try to see try to include a, a few extra kind of probabilistic conditions so try to roll a dice with a very small probability if you can even try to generate a live cell in in the middle of uh, other cells where there is no life so this can be another expansion or or the generalization of the game of life scene simulation. Is there any questions so far? All right, in that case, uh, these were all the things that I wanted to say about cellular automata, and uh, there are the material that is on the on the on the lecture uh, folder. You can go and check. Uh, there is particular material about how it connects to statistical physics, and if you would like to play with the code, you can download also on the files. And if you want to have access to the sample solution of the homework too. We're going to have it on Canvas in the following days. So I'm going to upload it there so you can download it and play with it. Uh, and one important announcement regarding with the course project groups is that each project group has a review group. And uh, you need to remember that you need to be in contact with your review group. So try to be in contact with them. If you haven't been in contact with them, contact them today. If uh, they haven't responded to your messages, contact us so we can contact your opponent group and make sure that there is smooth communication. It's essential that you have a group that reviews and exchanges opinions, gives, gives you feedback on your project so you can, you can make better results or get a lot more ideas what you can do on your project. Is this clear? I hope everyone has contacted their, their project review groups so far. Okay, is there any more questions about today's lecture or uh, projects or homeworks? Is there any practical applications of game of life simulation? Uh, to be honest, I am not very knowledgeable about the general applications and it's not my area of expertise. Uh, game of life, uh, what I only know is the how to simulate it and the simple rules and some sort of... Uh, uh, I know there is a big community that is uh, trying to come up with a lot of different ideas, uh, come up with something beautiful and looks good and these kind of things, but uh, I am not really sure. I am pretty sure there is a huge literature out there. So if you go out and uh, write on Google Scholar Game of Life, this relates to your projects as well. You can see there are 4 million papers, scientific studies about Game of Life simulation, 4 million. 
So you can see that this has to apply on some sort of uh, application and this needs, this should have been motivated in the, in the abstracts or introductions of these research uh, things. So you can, you can try to see yourself. But this is something that is really, really like uh, widely common, common among mathematicians. And they have been working on this and trying to simulate different things and try to draw conclusions on different systems for a, for a very long time. So I'm pretty sure there are lots of, uh, I'm, uh, like maybe not extremely practical applications, but uh, I'm pretty sure they're connected to a lot of different real time, uh, real world problems. Maybe not in a quantitative way, but qualitative way. You can always uh, search on uh, some kind of articles. Are there any other questions? What is my email address? My email address is, uh, should be, oh, uh, I can, I can write it in the chat. That's the easiest way, I think. But if you, if you write any message on, uh, to me on Canvas that will, uh, that I will, I will see it, I will receive it, and it will actually send a copy to my email address as well. But I can just in case, uh, uh, I write it in the chat, the, my email address. So if you want to contact directly by the email, you can use the, the, the address that I provide in the, in the chat now. But as I say, it's uh, my my canvas inbox works just as yours. So if you if you send me a message there, I, I'm gonna receive an email also. As I said in the beginning of the lecture, I highly recommend you check the announcement on the homework three. And depending on the some feedback and some more, uh, uh, and there were some typos and some mistakes in the in the homework file, I will also make another announcement uh, and uh, put it in the announcements on Canvas regarding homework three. So I recommend, uh, please check those out as well. So it's clear what to do for the homework three. And if you also have any questions about homework four, you can contact me or you can uh, uh, ask for help in the, in the homework session on Thursday. <laughs> there any more questions? Okay, if not, maybe we can end this lecture here today. And if you have more questions, you can always contact us. Great. Thank you.